you guys see me. I'm going to let you know. I know. You don't. Maybe I'm just going to be proud of you. I know you. I know. You got swing. I know. All right, good morning, everybody. The meeting of the Escambia County Planning Board for February 6, 2024 is hereby called to order with seven members uh, present. We do have a quorum. Um, uh, this is a reminder to please turn off your electronic devices or turn them to silent. Uh, and if everybody could, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. Cut it off, Mr. Reed. All right, do we have uh, proof of publication? Yes, sir. Did the publication meet all legal requirements? Yes, sir. I will now entertain a motion to waive the reading of the legal advertisement. All right, we've got a motion and we've got a second. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. All those opposed, all right, motion carries. The planning board meeting minutes from January 11th, 2024 have been provided to the board members. The chair will entertain a motion to accept the planning board meeting minutes into evidence. Do we have a motion? So moved. All right, do we have a second? Second. Great, all those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. All those opposed, all right, motion carries. The planning board hearing package for February 6th has been provided to the board. The chair will entertain a motion to accept the planning board <coughs> hearing package and the legal advertisement into evidence. Do we have a motion? So, so moved. All right, we've got a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Great. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. All those opposed? All right. Let's see. We will first move into a discussion uh, by the county attorney um, on expert witnesses protocol during a quasi-judicial forum. I'll turn it over to you. Let me go ahead and provide a handout for you all. So I plan to start doing this on a more regular basis. Just to provide you and I'll have you turn on your microphone if you don't mind. No, all good. I'll, I'll try to start doing these more frequently to provide, especially newer board members, more uh, background and how to come up with the record and how to make it as effective as possible. Um, what I want to go over today uh, is qualifications of experts. Uh, I'm open to suggestions for topics that you like to see covered in the future. And this, uh, this is really t uh, over the board that I'm directing my presentation to today. Um, so the overall qualification of expert, uh, it can be initiated by a party, by a board member. Uh, really, it's not important who initiates it. Anyone can. Uh, it's appropriate when anyone presents themselves as an expert in a given a topic. Um, as far as uh, it can be initiated upon a party's request for expert qualification. As far as the uh, actual script, it's not terribly important to follow this exact script. Uh, the important part is that it covers the expertise that you address whether the person uh, has that expertise, the educational background, any relevant cred credentials and professional experience that they may have that would give them uh, credibility in that area. Um, it's not enough that they just have credentials and pre present themselves as an expert in the area. Uh, they also have to confirm that the mes methods uh, that they have used are generally accepted in their field and reliably uh, applied reliably uh, to the facts of the case. Um, that's the, the, also the court standard that we use here. Um, and that's a really important part of it. It's just, you know, they, they can't just say certain things even though they have the credentials. They have to be able to back it up by some methodology. Um, and the last part of that is just a, a guide for the, uh, the motion to recognize the expert uh, as an area, uh, a subject matter area, area expertise. Excuse me. Um, as far as guidelines on expert testimony, uh, it must be based on sufficient facts or data, not just conjecture. Uh, reliable principle and methods, so they, they have to be industry used for the most part, uh, subject to some exceptions, and that is really the board's 
discretion whether to accept uh, other methods, but if it's ever challenged in court, it can be challenging uh, to support. Um, and re applying those principles reliably to the case in a replicable manner uh, is important. Uh, when it's required, so when the subject matter is beyond the common understanding of the average layperson, I know that doesn't provide too much uh, illumination on that, but that's kind of the standard we're looking at. Uh, really, in the context of the planning board, it's going to go to traffic, home values, the stuff that you guys regularly see. There's nothing really new on this, um, but that does require some form of expertise. And it doesn't have to be a specific profession, but it has to lend itself to that the expert would have some, or the person would have some expertise in that area. They don't have to be, you know, purely a traffic expert to, uh, on on something. So it has to be related. So that there doesn't have to be a direct relationship, but it can be related to their profession. Um, so when the issue involves technical, scientific, or specialized knowledge that will assist the board in the understanding of evidence or determining uh, fact and issue. Um, so someone in emergency service may be able to speak to some amount of traffic issues. It, it really is up to the, the board to decide these things. Uh, sometimes they're in the middle and they're hard to really say but you can't consider the evidence if it's presented as expert evidence uh, without qualif qualification of the expert, uh, qualification of the expert. Um, as far as board initi we, initiative and reliance on expert testimony, we went over that briefly already. Uh, the board in, can and should proactively determine whether ex expert testimony is necessary. Uh, so if someone's presenting and they present themselves as an expert, uh, the board has the obligation should they choose uh, if they believe the other board, if they believe that they would rely on that information, they should initiate uh, the qualification of uh, expert witness, uh, testimony. Excuse me. Um, went over this already as well. Mere assertions are not sufficient. It must explain how their experience leads to their conclusions, why their uh, experience is sufficient basis for their opinion, and how that experience is reliably applied to the facts. Um, and again, qualification of expert does not compel the board to accept their findings, but allows the testimony to be considered. So just because you accept someone as an expert witness does not mean you have to accept all of their testimony and have to rely on it. Um, and and th this plays into really more the, the, when it's appealed, there has to be competent substantial evidence. So uh, expert testimony qualifies as competent substantial evidence where a lot of layperson testimony does not. Uh, layperson testimony, just to give a brief background on that, is um, they, they can appeal or they, they, can, um, they can testify to the appeal of a neighborhood, the character, really the soft characteristics of it, it and that does qualify as competent substantial evidence, but the board cannot wholly rely on that for their decision. Uh, so there needs to be something more uh, to a de specific decision by the board. Uh, and further, uh, fact-based testimony that can be provided by an expert or a layperson, uh, and fact-based is what it sounds like, uh, the facts surrounding a particular uh, instance uh, would constitute fact-based testimony. Uh, the, the standard for all of this is preponderance of the evidence. So the standard for qualification of an expert is preponderance of the evidence. More likely than not uh, is the standard for determining, uh, and the board uh, gets to weigh the evidence and credibility of the witness, of the expert a witness. So I hope this provides some insight into this uh, in the future. I believe we're going to cover Sunshine Law next because we have a newer board member. Uh, but if there's any topics that you guys would like um, expounded on more, I'm happy to cover it in, f in the future. And I'm open to questions as well, unfortunately. Current procedure of this board is to vote on whether to accept someone as an expert before they speak. This is telling us to qualify their testimony as expert, so we have to hear the testimony before we decide to qualify them? It can be done either way. Preferably at the front end if they're, uh, preferably at the front end, but it can be also done at the back end after the testimony is received. Then Horace, how do we, how do we navigate the two minute limit for an expert witness if he's not qualified as an expert until after we hear him? You turn, no. We definitely we definitely have to follow the the um, the attorney's um, direction on that question. 
But to to make a determination after he get through him whether or not he was an expert, that's that's a little unique. So I believe it's going to be up to the I believe it should be up to the chair because. Well, I think if I understood the last part of what you shared with us this morning, we would vote to qualify them as an expert, but then at the end possibly vote again as to whether to qualify their particular testimony as acceptable or not. Mm. Good, yeah. That, that's... And, and you make a good point there. Uh, the board does have the discretion to offer more time if they do decide to qualify the expert. Uh, and, and can ask further additional questions. Should, because, because they are an expert witness, um, do you still want them to turn it, should they still be governed by a time limitation? I mean, that's, that's the, because you know, our, our boys get very, very long, especially what we do, what y'all do. You get very, very lengthy and, in detail and dramatic at times, and sometimes it get very emotional. So, 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 and that's fact because we're dealing with land uses. So, should there be even as experts get emotional about their position? So, should there still be a time? In, limit in general, I, I think they should be entitled to the same two minutes. But if the board wants to hear from them more, uh, they have the full discretion to ask. Uh, they they can uh, ask the person to elaborate. They can offer more time. Uh, it's really the board's discretion. I don't want to just give a free pass to anyone uh, who does have credentials to just speak as long as they want, but it's the board at that that point would decide that. Am I wrong in thinking that's how it is now, though? If they're considered an expert witness, this they shouldn't are not change limited that. by the two minutes. I I know that I know that in the past, in, in my understanding, I know that Jay and uh, uh, been a long walk as well. That that sometimes discretion has been given to attorneys. That discretion has been given to attorneys. Those that are being represented by a client, they have they have been allowed. The chairman has allowed them more time. Um, but again, that's up to the chairman and the, the board how y'all want to proceed with those matters. But I don't think we're talking about attorneys because attorneys have a higher level anyways right we're not questioning their authority and their you know credentials this is anybody other than a real estate person whatever happens to be engineer <coughs> those are the ones that we're going questioning so it's, it's a little bit different than an attorney's uh, coming up and speaking for the uh, client okay that's a good point so uh, okay i got I guess two questions here. So one, I mean, I see this as uh, somebody that's coming in on behalf of the applicant themselves. Do we get notice from the applicant that they're going to bring in an expert witness and 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 ask them to so, bring the requirements yeah, with them? Some, sometimes, um, in the case if there's an, someone acting as an agent, like for example, Mr. Page, uh, he 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 qualifies himself sometimes as an expert an agent representing the client. So I guess it's just okay. different scenarios, uh, 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 um, different situations. Mr. Wilson, about how you want to, what the advice of legal, how to handle those things. Because we do get clients yeah. acting as agents, a representative. But that, that still don't mean that they're yeah. an expert. They just may have been chosen to speak in the behalf of someone who's not good and speaking in the public. Right. Okay. So then the second part of this is then we'll have members of the public that wish to speak as an expert witness on a quasi judicial case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do we almost need a separate form for them to indicate that they would like to do so and so that we know to bring them up and, and allocate time to let them you know, make their spiel about why this board should qualify them as an expert? That's your discretion. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be opening a certain can of worms, yes. but that's your discretion. Yes. Uh, I will tell you this, looking on the back side after these things go to appeals, having competent substantial evidence is very important for the cases I make. And if they're not, it's a very difficult case for me to make. So qualify, qualification of expert testimony is very important for the record. Uh, so this is something that really does matter to the board. Uh, 
So, so, Mr. and I think he, just someone saying that I am an expert witness, I don't think that is sufficient. I think there should come Certainly not. With, with some qualifications based upon, uh, because for example, every, and I'm not just factual because we hear this all the time, every <clears throat> neighbor can, makes qualify themselves as an expert of the, of the surrounding area because they lived there for 20 years. So, so, so that's, it's, those are things that you really have to try to hear out and weigh out and uh, advise with the legal department. I mean, it sounds like no matter what, we have individual qualifiers for every single time. It sounds like it's going to be up to the chair's discretion every single time, correct? I mean, it doesn't really change this. I mean, not trying to no. simplify this for the rest of the board. I mean, just, I mean we're not if, really changing anything. But Just trying to clarify. Yeah, we clarify should just try to get more qualifiers. Between me and you, you all as well. Uh, for how we're going to handle, how you all are going to handle yeah. these. So we should try vet them more on qualifiers on the outset, essentially. I, I would certainly appreciate it. Okay. I, my, I really like to have a strong record to work with uh, and qualification of an expert, even if uh, it, it really does help me out. Yeah, I think we've only had one or two since I've been on this board that have ever even bordered on that discussion. So I don't That's what I've kind of come across, is there's not a, 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 a strong history of it. Uh, if the board decided to do a form, I, I think that would be probably a good idea, um, just in order to strengthen the credibility of, of these people uh, who would like to be qualified as experts. But it, again, it's board discretion, and I know time is of essence in a lot of these as well. And and and, and 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 I think and I think and I think we could I I would suggest that basically that we we may want to come back because this is this is this is pertinent and it's not nothing just to gloss over um, because I can see what it's y'all minds are thinking and I can see that so it may be something that you may want to come back and if there's so if there's some different forms that are required we could think about that we could review that because I would like for at least there'll be some check boxes on what. We consider so y'all can consider as experts. So maybe we may want to come back to that. And, and yeah, I'm gonna see this as um, you know, as, similar to when we're going through one of these rezoning cases, and we've got to look at certain criteria that mm -hmm. these things have to meet. And I, I certainly think that for your end, and I, I get where you're coming from, is um, you want this to kind of be standard and across the board for everybody that we accept as an expert witness. And what criteria are they meeting um, that meets our standards? And so right. it's not just different every single time someone gets up here um so I, I think you know maybe to horse's point we we take what we've gotten here from the attorney and if there's anything that we'd like to add or delete um we, we certainly maybe need to let staff know that so we can have a discussion next month and then yes. maybe adopt something like this yes. um, for us yes. to have some guidelines to follow as we move forward yes mr chair i've got an idea but right. i won't take up the time of the of the rezoning um session today but maybe i'll bring it up in public forum later and might help us with a springboard into it okay all right great any other discussion on this at, at this point all right then we'll move on all right so uh just for everyone's uh so everyone knows we will be uh, kind of jumping back and forth a little bit today from our regular meeting to our uh, rezoning meeting um, so we can kind of get everything we got to do some things in some funny orders up here sometimes uh, so this is one of those days so um, here we go we're going to get into our first public hearing this is a public hearing concerning the review of an ordinance amending the future land use map SSA-2024-01 that the board review and recommend to the Board of County Commissioners an ordinance amending Chapter 7, the future land use flu element policy flu 1-1-1.1 to provide an amendment to the 2030 flu map SSA-2024-01, changing the flu category of a parcel located within Section 17 Township 2S, range 30 W parcel number 17-2S-30-5009-0001 
0.15-064, totaling 0.15 plus or minus acres located on Cross Street from public to mixed use urban. All right. And I know that we've got the uh, agent here, Megan Polk from the county on this. Um, do we want to start with uh, staff going with an overview or, or have Ms. Ms. Polk come up and and walk us through this? Maybe we'll do a presentation of the maps and Ms. Polk okay. come in. Is that good with you, Ms. Polk, if we go over it? Okay, great. Thanks so much. Good morning. Uh, my name is Megan Polk. I'm a program manager with the Neighborhood Human Services Department. Um, so we are requesting to change the future land use of this property from public to from mix public to mixed use in order to build um, a single family home for our infill housing program. So these homes will be uh, sold for sold to low to moderate income buyers. Um, it's located in the Inglewood area next to the Boys and Girls Club. The surround can you go to that. So the, the surrounding area um, also has a zoning of HDR um, and the surrounding area also has a um, mixed use urban feature land use. And I'll stand by for any questions. All right, All right board, does anybody have any questions um, for Ms. Polk? Why was that little lot P to begin with, jutting I, out there from the. You know what? I, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know if they anticipated maybe that being a pocket park. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, we found that odd as well. But we did go through the um, departmental review, so we sent all departments to verify that there was no need for that property. So that's why we chose that one. I got a couple questions. Uh, I noticed there's no sewer to this prop to this parcel. Uh, ECUA states that, and uh, so I'm assuming, or I'm guessing that it would probably end up being a uh, septic system. And uh, and additionally, I noticed under the uh, well wellhead of protection that there is a this parcel is within a wellhead protection area. So I'm just wondering how septic or the 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 sewer and the wellhead protection area are gonna uh, how those are gonna interact. Um, so so the prop so sewer is available at this property. Um, uh, we did get that set up uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, so sewer will be available here. So the analysis is incorrect. Because it's done prior to the analysis. The analysis was done prior to. So, so therefore, if they, if they just recently got got the sewer system connected, that's that's a new finding, and staff and everything still concur with that, according to what you just stated. Okay, so to be clear, the EC way is providing sewer. Yes, sir. To the parcel. Yes, sir. Good. All right. Any further questions? All right. We do have uh, one speaker for this public hearing. Uh, Mr. Larry Downs Jr., if you'll please come up and state your name and address for the record, and uh, we'll start your three minutes. Uh, Larry Downs Jr., Plumbing LLC, because fecal matters. I forgot. All right. Uh, yeah, I think I put on my form that I was against this. I had uh, I, I messed up. I'm for this. So just if you got that for right, me, yeah, just we got to check that for me. Thanks, Larry. Yeah. Anytime anybody is uh, wanting to utilize their property. Y'all should uh, move towards allowing that. Isn't that sad? Even allowing if it's the that. county, even if it's the government. It, it, <laughs> no, Mr. did you Reed? did you Mr. hear Reed? what I just said? <laughs> allowing that. <laughs> so the government is allowed by us. Do you see? See how that works? And then the government's up here, and we gotta beg and pay. You know, it's sad. Y'all need to get back to this. You know, even the Bill of Rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. So anyways, every one of these that come up that want to rezone their property so that they can use it, you know, as they see fit, let's do it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Downs. All right, we got no more speakers. Um, staff, I don't know if there's anything else from you all. If if not, uh, we'll certainly entertain a motion up here on our on our end. And I would just want to just be clear for our records to indicate that yes, it's going to do that about about the sewer that's now available for the property because I was showing that it's septic tank, but we want to make sure that's stated that get that correction so we can make that correction. Move for approval for Z 2024-04. Second. And just it's, to clarify. Uh, just to clarify, it's SSA-2024-01. There, there you uh, go. Okay. Yeah, second the correct one. All right. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. All right, motion carries 7-0. All right, at this time, we will jump over. We'll um, close our regular meeting for the moment, and we will move over to our rezoning meeting. All right. The meeting of the Escambia County Planning Board for February 6th is hereby called to order with seven voting members present. We do have a quorum. Did we have proof of publication? Yes, sir. Did the publication meet all legal requirements? Yes, sir. I'll entertain a motion to waive the reading of the legal advertisement. So moved. We've got a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We've got a second. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Motion carries. The rezoning meeting minutes from the previous Meeting date, January 11th, have been provided to the board members. Are there any additions, deletions, or corrections? Right, seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion to accept the rezoning meeting. Move. All right, we've got a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Great. All those opposed, motion carries. The rezoning hearing package for February 6, 2024, with findings of facts, has been provided to the board members. The chair will entertain a motion to accept the rezoning hearing package with findings of fact and the legal advertisement into evidence. Do we have a motion? So moved. We got a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We got a second. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. All right, motion carries 7 to 0. Will the court reporter please swear in members of the staff? Right. And the board has previously qualified staff to offer expert testimony in the area of land use and planning. Does anyone have any questions regarding their qualifications and ability to offer expert testimony today? All right. At this hearing, the planning board is acting under its authority to hear and make recommendations to the board of county commissioners on rezoning applications. These hearings are quasi-judicial in nature. Quasi-judicial hearings are like evidentiary hearings in a court of law, however less formal. All testimony will be given under oath, and anyone testifying before the planning board may be subject to cross-examination. All documents and exhibits that the planning board considers will be entered into evidence and made part of the record. Opinion testimony will be limited to experts and closing arguments will be limited to the evidence in the record. Before making a decision, the planning board will consider the relevant testimony, the exhibits entered into evidence, and the applicable law. Each individual who wishes to address the planning board must complete a speaker request form and submit it to the planning board clerk. These forms are on the table in the back of the boardroom. You will not be allowed to speak until we receive a completed form. Please note that only those individuals who are present and give testimony on the record at this hearing before the planning board will be allowed to speak at the hearing before the Board of County Commissioners. No new evidence can be presented at the Board of County Commissioners meeting. Therefore, all testimony and evidence must be presented here today. The planning board will provide a recommendation for each rezoning request to the Board of County Commissioners, which will review testimony, documents, and exhibits, consider the closing arguments, and make a final decision. All decisions by the BCC are final. Anyone who wishes to seek judicial review after the decision of the BCC must do so in a court of competent jurisdiction within 30 days of the date the BCC approves or rejects the recommended order of the Planning Board. 
all written or oral communications outside of this hearing with the members of the planning board regarding matters under consideration today are considered ex parte communications. Ex parte communications are presumed prejudicial under Florida law and must be disclosed as provided in BCC resolution number 96-13. As each case is heard, I will ask that any board member who has been involved in ex parte communication, please identify themselves and describe the communication. As required by section 2-7.2 of the Escambia County Land Development Code, the planning board's recommendation to the Board of County Commission shall include consideration of the following six approval conditions. The applicant has the burden of presenting competent substantial evidence to the reviewing board establishing that the requested zone requested zoning district would be would contribute to or result in a logical and orderly development pattern. The appropriate surrounding area within which uses and conditions must be considered may vary with those uses and conditions and is not necessarily the same area required for mail notification. A logical and orderly pattern shall require demonstration of each of the following conditions. A. Consistent with the comprehensive plan that the proposed zoning is consistent with the future land use flu category as prescribed in LDZ, LDC chapter 3 and with all other goals, objectives, and policies of the comprehensive plan. If the rezoning is required to properly enact a proposed flu map amendment transmitted for state agency review, the proposed zoning is consistent with the proposed flu and conditional to its adoption. B, consistent with zoning district provisions. The proposed zoning is consistent with the purpose and intent with any other zoning establishment provisions prescribed by the proposed district in Chapter 3. C, compatible with surroundings. All of the permitted uses of the proposed zoning, not just those anticipated by the rezoning applicant, are compatible as defined in Chapter 6 with the surrounding uses. The uses of any surrounding undeveloped land shall be considered the permitted uses of the applicable district. Compatibility is not considered with potential conditional uses or any non-conforming or unapproved uses. Also, in establishing the compatibility of a res residential use, there is no additional burden to demonstrate the compatibility of specific residents or activities protected by a fair housing law. D, appropriate as spot zoning where the proposed zoning would establish or reinforce a condition of spot zoning as defined in chapter 6 the isolated district would nevertheless be transitional in character between the adjoining districts or the differences with those districts would be minor or sufficiently limited the extent of these mitigating <coughs> characteristics or conditions demonstrates an appropriate site-specific balancing of entrance between the isolated district and adjoining lands appropriate with changed or changing conditions if the land uses or development conditions within the area surrounding the property of rezoning have changed the changes are to such a degree in character that it is in the public interest to allow new uses densities and intensities in the area through rezoning and the permitted uses of the proposed district are appropriate and not premature for the area or likely to create or contribute to sprawl at the beginning of each case, as long as there are no objections from the applicant, we will allow staff to per briefly present the location and zoning maps and photos for the property. Next, we will hear from the applicant and any witnesses that they may wish to call. Then we will hear from staff and any witnesses they may wish to call. And finally, we will hear from members of the public who have filled out a speaker request form. There are two cases to be heard today. The first rezoning application for consideration is case Z-2024-04. Uh, applicant is Escambia County. The address is 1209 West Cross Street. Property size is 0.15 plus or minus acres. This is a request from public district uh, to high density residential district. Members of the board, have there been any ex parte communication between you and the applicant 
of the applicant's agents, attorneys, or witnesses, with fellow planning board members, or anyone from the general public prior to this hearing. Have you visited the subject property? Please also disclose if you are a relative or business associate of the applicant or the applicant's agent. All right. We'll start down here at the end. Mr. Adams? No to all. 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 All right, great. Staff was notice of the hearing sent to all interested parties? Yes, sir. Was notice of the hearing posted on the subject property? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, staff will now present the maps and photographs for KC 2024 04. Good morning. My name is Kimberly Wilson. I'm the senior urban planner. So, this is the location map for said parcel at 1209 West Cross Street. This is the 500 foot radius map for said parcel 1209 West Cross Street. This is the future land use map. This is the proposed uh, future land use map. This is the CRA, the uh, CRA map, excuse me. Wellhead map. And the existing land use map. This is the aerial map. Public hearing signs. This is looking south onto the property. Looking east, down Cross Street. Looking west. And that concludes the map. All right, great. Um, do we have um, anything from the, the applicant? Uh, Ms. Polk, I think you're representing uh, the county again on this, correct? I guess. Um, it, did you receive a copy of the rezoning hearing package with the findings of facts yes, from the sir. county? Yes, um, and then we did already have you sworn in. Um, so you can, please go ahead. Um, this is a companion request to the rezoning um, in order to construct a single family home. So I'm here for any questions. All right. And you, did you agree with staff's oh, so finding of fact? <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Great. Okay. Good stuff. Uh, board, is there any questions at this time? Okay. All right, we do have uh, one speaker, Mr. Larry Downs, Jr. Uh, if you'll please come forward, state your name and address for the record, and be sworn in for, for this as we are under quasi-judicial. Larry Downs, Jr., uh, 12156 Habberg Drive, Pensacola, Florida, 32506. All right. And swear in. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, this one here is uh, pretty interesting as well. Uh, the uh, county is the uh, owner, which I guess that would, it's kind of weird uh, that they would be going before themselves to get approval. Shouldn't we have a, you know, a board of citizens that approve that? Maybe a separate board? Y'all are appointed. <laughs> How about a citizen appointed board, not a <laughs> politician appointed? Anyways, uh, of course I'm for this. Uh, let's, let's move forward. Uh, the more things we can do with properties, period, the better. Uh, you know, there's no such thing as, uh, as uh, time not moving on. And, you know, for a better expression, you know, shit going down. It's going to go down. Uh, so let's uh, let's move forward. But I do like this the fact that uh, you know the county's asking for this, which is technically we the people. So when we the people ask for something, we should get it. You know what I mean? If it's our property, just like this property, it's pretty cool how that works. Y'all should y'all should go back through the founding documents and look at what they considered the secret to prosperity was. It was property rights. And whenever y'all deny property rights to property owners, then y'all pick and choose winners and losers of that prosperity. So keep that in mind when you're moving forward. And go ahead and grant this one as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Downs. All right, is there any uh, further discussion from the board at this time? If not, then I 
would entertain a motion that anyone would like to make. Move to accept. Second. All right, we've got a motion to accept staff's findings of fact and a second. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. All right, motion carries seven to zero. Um, okay, now we're gonna jump back to our regular planning board meeting for another pub public hearing. All right, we've got a public hearing concerning the review of an ordinance amending the future land use map, SSA-2024-02 that the board review and recommend to the board and county commissioners on an ordinance amending chapter seven, the flu element to provide an amendment to the 2030 flu map, changing the flu category, a parcel located within section 17, uh, totaling 0.16 plus or minus acres located on North H street from public to mixed use urban. All right, staff at this time, uh, if you wanna go through those those photos for us. This is the location map for said parcel at 2627 North 8th Street. The radius map. The existing flu map. The proposed flu map. Wohead map. CRA map. Aerial map. Public hearing sign, looking west down cross street, the parcel, looking east down cross, looking south onto the parcel. That concludes the maps. Great, thank you. Um, anything, Ms. Polk, that you'd like to add or? Um, at this property, we'll be uh, building a single family home as well, but this one will be on septic. Uh, sewer is not available. So the health department did tell us we were limited to a two bedroom house at this property. Okay. So. Thank you. Is there any questions from the board about this public hearing case? So again, the concern is it's in a wellhead area. And uh, <clears throat> if you look at your ECUA bill, at least I do, I have probably five or six line items on there for improvement fees. One is a sewer improvement fee. They're, the ECUA is trying to get people off of septic and onto sewer, so this is kind of counter to that. And uh, as Mr. Down says, we the people will end up paying for that in the long run. So uh, again, that's a concern of mine. We, we did attempt to or request to get sewer available, but um, I forgot the terminology, but uh, the way it flows, they said they, they just wouldn't do it. So we volunteered to pay for it, and it just wasn't, they said, better do septic so and and being and, and being that they are a separate board uh with their own rules and regulations the offer was made by the county this is the ecua board they have the no, they have control of that's, that's understood of and you know every time i look at my ecua bill and i see all these line items for uh sewer improvement fees and other things and i happen to be on a, a private list station so there's that's, that's an issue in and of itself. So uh, it just concerns me that once again, down the road, the uh, ratepayers are gonna have to pay to have this, this property converted from septic to sewer. All right, anything else from the board? If not, I'll uh, entertain a motion on this public hearing actually I did um, hold on yeah Larry I, I, my bad so we do have one speaker uh, mr. Larry Downs jr. please come forward and state your name and address for the record and we'll get your time started Larry Downs jr. 12156 Hadberg Drive Pensacola Florida 32506 and uh, I'm already sworn in right yeah. all right uh, yeah there's no problem with aseptic systems. It's just, it's conditioned and indoctrinated into you. I get it, I get it. There's no problem with aseptic systems. They work fine. I've been working on them f for 35 years. They work great. ECUA, uh, I'm a little bit of an expert in this. ECUA has something to sell you. Just like Pfizer and Moderna has something to, safe and effective to sell you. 
That's the way it works. They're selling you sewage, uh, it, taking your sewage and taking your money. These septic systems work great. They work great. <laughs> stop, stop believing, you know, your tankless water heater, we're killing the climate crap. It's all crap. It's all about control and taking your money. So they control you, take your money, and you believe the, the nonsense. So anyways, approve this. Septic system or not makes no difference. All right. Just wake up. Let's get woke. All right. Thank you. Do I have a question for Mr. Downs? So, I mean, he, he, he uh, stated he was an expert. Does the board accept him as an expert? Hey, it's, well, I got a I, shirt that says. Uh, <laughs> I, hold on. Hold on. Uh, we we only need to qualify expert witnesses in a quasi judicial case at this time. We're in a public hearing, so there's no okay. necessity for that. But okay, well, the, the, the point I was the making question. with the septic, the point I was making with the septic is, eventually the ECUA is going to to try to convert that septic to to a sewer. And I don't have a problem with, sept with septic. I'm with you. I don't have a problem with that. But down the road. The ratepayers are going to be on the hook for that. That's my concern. I, I get your concern, and and what I'm telling you is, is that most of the people, most unless they qualify for some sort of government subsidy, they pay for their own septic to sewer conversion. Yeah, I, I, I got ten estimates right now that are going through, and they're paying different prices because different distances, different everything. But even whenever they get converted. It still is on them unless there's some sort of, you know, like the government, re overreaching, overreaching, trying to get into the rest of our pockets for the benefit of one. That's wrong, just like the jabs. That's wrong. They're making us pay for them, and I didn't get them. <laughs> I don't want to pay for them. <laughs> and again, the, the intent of this property is it's going to be uh, sold based on uh, income. That's my understanding. That's another government overreach. But let's move forward with this cluster. Y'all know what. <laughs> and Thank Jay, you. hey, I was about to say, yeah, most is funded by the actual rate payer in that sense. But this one specifically is in a CRA area. So there are grants and stuff to help hook these up. So there is, how do I say this, intent to always hook it on to sewer. It just if it's not feasible, you know. But luckily we have these great community redevelopment agencies in our area. They help with that. So put a shout out to that. Sometimes I help. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, if we've got no further discussion or anything else from staff or the applicant at this time, I will entertain a motion uh, <clears throat> for this public hearing. Motion to approve. We've got a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We've got a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. All right. Motion carries. All right, and now we're going to jump back on over to our rezoning meeting. Uh, just a reminder, this is quasi-judicial in nature. Um, so if you are coming forward to speak, um, you will need to be sworn in under oath, and you will need to, if you'd like to speak on this case before the Board of County Commissioners, uh, you will need to speak here today. This is a public hearing concerning the review of Macaria Ridge subdivision, a planned unit development or a PUD, that the board review the development plan for the residential subdivision, a PUD, and confirm consistency of the plan with the LDC requirements prior to transmittal of a recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners to review and consider the plan for a final decision. All right, I will um, at this time ask staff to please i know we've got a letter here um that we need to discuss and possibly add into evidence and then i'll let you run through y'all's presentation the letter that is in front of you is just the narrative that's been updated the narrative that's in the working case file um, needs to be replaced with this updated version okay all right, board, uh, we have been provided this letter by the applicant, um, and they have requested that we add this into their evidence. So if anyone would like to make a motion to so do moved. so. moved. All right, we've got a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? If not, please signify by raising your right hand. 
on those posts. All right, we've added that into evidence. Um, Mr. Hammond, are you okay with staff running through? Um, okay, thanks so much. Um, good afternoon, um, good morning, board members. My name is Horace Jones, Director for the Development Service Department. I will be going through this rather quickly. Um, Mr. Terry Williams, um, he's the senior planner. Uh, he's definitely deeply busy at this time. So I will be moving through this very quickly um, and giving, giving Tom Hammond, the, the agent basically, with the opportunity to make his case for these planned units development. So we do have the Macari Ridge, and I believe that there will be a name change on this to Macari West. Um, Macari, there will be a name change. For the record, it's going to be called, I hope I said it correctly, Macari West Subdivision Plan Unit Development. If I did say it correctly, Mr. Tom's going to come and straighten me out. Um, so that's the location map. That's the Macari Ridge. That's the 500 feet radius zoning map. Uh, that's the future land use map of mixed use suburban. That is the area map. That's the public sign for the plan unit development hearing, public hearing with you all. That's the looking from the south, subject property from the subject property. That is looking north along the subject property. That's looking east across West Robert Road from the subject property. And that concludes the maps. All right. Um, I did forget to ask our board members if there was any ex parte communication, so I will run through that at this time, Mr. Adams, uh, for this public hearing on a PUD. No to all. 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 Great. Uh, all right. At this time, uh, Mr. Hammonds, I'll have you come up and please uh, run us through your presentation on your application. Yes, I do. Tom Hammond, founder of Hammond Engineering. Um, y'all want to test y'all's expert witness case now? Yeah. I've been, I've been uh, sworn in as expert witness probably for the last 20 years in front of the BCC and this board. But All right, as previously, uh, it, Mr. Hammond has requested to be an expert witness. Uh, we have previously qualified him as well as the Board of County Commissioners. Does anyone have any questions for him? Uh, before I'll entertain a motion. Motion to acknowledge. Second. All right, we got a motion to accept Mr. Hammonds as an expert witness. Uh, we've got a second. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. All right, great. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Makira Ridge is a subdivision we did in Santa Rosa County and then I did the same thing here, and my client asked me to change it to McCarra West for his own reasons. <clears throat> so PUD, if you'll notice on the zoning map, it is MDR zoned above us, MDR zoned below us. Um, the one above us, north of our property, is kind of developed as an MDR type subdivision. Um, we could have done a rezoning. The idea was it probably be bring less opposition if we came through it this way and then offered some amenities. We're asking for one variance, that's to reduce the lot width. Um, to reduce the lot width below what LDR lot width is required. Um, so that, that's why we're here. The project is a proposed 60 lot plan unit development. The right of ways will be public and have underground utilities and asphalt roads. It will have a single access to West Roberts Road. There will be a 2.2 acre passive use area, which will be used a lot, utilized for central mail kiosks, gazebos, basketball and pickleball courts, playground, park, etc. It will have two access points to the park, and we'll put sidewalks in this subdivision, even though they're not required. Those are the benefits to the public good that you're supposed to provide when you do a PUD in return for asking for the variance. Um, potable water and sewer will be provided by the ECUA. Um, and I just told you what the public benefits were. Um, staff analysis, I went through staff analysis um, 
and I like to walk through it a little bit and kind of respond to some of the stuff they said in it, if I may. Uh, one, we're asking for one variance, and that's the reduction in the minimum lot width. Uh, land uses. Um, the proposed single family residential use is allowed by the applicable zoning district in the future land use category. Density, the proposed number of dwelling units does not exceed the residential density allowed by the zoning district in the applicable future land use category. Other processes. The preliminary development plan of the PUD has been forwarded to the planning board. Um, let me skip down to exactly what we were talking about here. Basically, other processes is us going through DRC when we get it done here and if we get approved and doing preliminary plaque, construction plans, the normal process as if this didn't happen. So we still got hoops to jump through. Standards, the proposed development will comply with all applicable level services standards, compliance review, Planning officials forward the proposed PUD in analysis of its compliance. Criteria for PUD approval, creative planning, the presence of wetlands and FEMA special flood hazard areas of development, you know, that encumber this site. So us making smaller lots, but still keeping single family residential detached lots, which is compatible with the surrounding area is where we're coming in with is considered creative planning. And they recommend that the PUD document the characteristics of the dwelling units to which the PUD can commit, including floor area, stores, stories, provision of garage or other parking outside of right of ways and any diversity of housing styles and materials. So y'all were here last week, last month, and we talked about the new parking requirements that are coming. And I think they're gonna go um, I think Ms. Blackman said, even though y'all y'all recommended denial, she's still taking it to BCC. It'll be going there Thursday, and the development community pretty much is not going to oppose the changes. So <clears throat> our minimum lot depth. I'm going to address parking. Our minimum lot depth here is 118 feet. You still got the LDR 25 foot building setback lines. So. And it, we're 49, the minimum lot width, 49 foot. You can put a double wide garage on it. You can put a single um, double wide driveway on it. And you got 25 foot. So you put two cars next to each other and then put one in the garage or two in the garage and we're going to meet the new requirements. Now, I didn't put all that together for this, but I saw that in here. So I wanted to address that here. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the staff recommends so natural amenities, and that's where we're clustering a little bit to avoid wetland impacts and that type of thing. That's why another reason we're asking for the minimum lot width, a smaller lot width. Let's go to desirable environment. I hired wetland sciences. They're the ones come out there, located the wetlands, wrote the report. Um, there are some proposed wetlands to be filled, but we already met with the state and the type of wetlands they are, not the kind of wetlands that are either not as valuable as other type of wetlands. I'm not a scientist, that's why I'm not getting my verbiage exactly right. But the state basically said we're good with the area that we're filling and don't fill the rest of it. So that's what we're showing on our proposed plan. And we'll still go through DRC and get the ERP and all the rest of the items that are gonna need to be needed. <clears throat> All the rest of the um, findings we agree with. So that's pretty much the end of my speech, and I'll take any questions. All right. Anybody have any questions? I have two questions. Uh, one may, one for, for you, Tom, and staff may be able to fill in. What's the minimum lot width for MDR? Fifty. For MDR. Fifty. You're asking 49.5. Just... Some of the other lots are 52. I mean, I could, if you want, I could massage it and make them 50. I mean, if that was something that needed to happen. Uh, and the other question is, if this, did, what's the difference between the number of homes that will go in here if it gets approved versus not getting it? If it gets approved, I see it's 60. If it's not approved, what would it be? 
roughly 50. If you take, I'm just doing rough math here, we got 60 lots at 50 foot. You're going to lose 10. Yeah, it's going to be 10, 10 lots. So we'd be getting a density of 50 lots. That's all I have. Tom, what are they, where's this, this storm water? It says in here it's running to that countryside of states. Are we good that that's going to contain that storm that you're so here, developing? Here's, I'm glad you asked because this is engineering. So I've already been out there and walked around countryside of states, which is downhill, and for some reason that pond is shallow and it only covers about 75% of the buildable area in there. So my first thought was, and I met with a county engineer on this, and that pond was built before, I think, when it was just 25-year attenuation pond. So my, my deal with the county is we're going to regrade that pond, redesign that pond. We're going to bring it up to grade so countryside of states is, and I'm going to try to fit our stormwater in there too. And then we've just got a <laughs> positive discharge already to 11 Mile Creek. If yeah. that doesn't work out, then we'll be tying into the regional pond that's just south of countryside of states. Gotcha. Okay. The only reason I ask that creek runs to Bristol Park. That's that troublesome creek back there. Yes, sir. So all that storm water in that area runs to that creek, and we know that history of that. So anything we add to that creek is potentially a problem. We just got to be careful. Keep in mind that we can't let no more water go there as far as a flow rate that goes there pre-development. Uh, correct me on my terminology, but is that pond a dry pond? Or yes, sir. A... All right, do we have any further questions? We do have uh, two individuals that have signed up to speak uh, on this issue, so we'll go ahead and bring them up at this time. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, first, we've got Ty Daughtry. If you'll please come forward and state your name and address for the record and be sworn in. Hi, my name is Ty Doherty. I live at 2790 West Roberts Road. And uh, this. Oh, yes. We saw on this that your testimony was about civil leadership. Yes. I uh, am here today because the result of this meeting matters to me. Um, it also would affect me in many ways. Um, having the opening of the subdivision directly across from my house um, would cause some conflicts for traffic on the road, noises, and, and myself of... Um, my my career um say i i lose a lot more sleep with all the traffic and um not sleeping be, throughout the noises of the traffic because people work day shift night shift etc um it all would uh affect my career and my privacy as well um this is my first house I've ever had. I'm 35 years old and uh, I'm still working to pay off my house. So my work pays my house and my studies help my progression. Um, so uh, if I can't work as well at work, there could be a chance that I would have, I would be on the list to be reviewed and uh have a possible layoff and I don't want to get laid off. I wouldn't have a house that way. Um, so the conflicts that this brings to me would be the traffic and noise on the road um, throughout day and night. Um, possibility of electricity throughout the community, rates and such. Um, crime, drugs and theft in the area. Um, and uh, my privacy as well. Um, and then how the opening of the road is directly from my house. People have pets and I have one myself. And when they go for a walk, that's the major spot that their dog could possibly all funnel to is 
when I see somebody walking their dog, my new conversation would be, oh, good to see you today, you know, while their dog is going to the restroom. So that's something that I don't want to have to deal with. I don't want to have to feel like I need a sign in my yard for that as well. But um, the construction um, throughout this project, it will bring uh, everything that has to do with construction. And I moved to that house a year and a half ago last October and since then they've already built two subdivisions and have had a storm water drainage throughout the entire road of that area and the storm drain took six months to uh, repave the road so I had cars driving through dirt flying around and and then when they finally got to paving the road it really shook my house and pictures fell off we just want to so I'm a big, up, I'm a big no. Okay. Sir, real, real oh, and quick. then can I say one more thing for 10 seconds? Sure. Uh, so when I come home, I want to enjoy it. There are a lot of other areas to build in. There are probably a lot of unsold houses in my area, some from the two other recent subdivisions built. And please, for all the reasons, do not do this to me and my dog. Thank you. you have a question. Sir, which parcel is yours on the map? Directly in front. Yes, that's it right there. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, our next spe speaker is Ms. Helen Gibson. If you'll please come forward and state your name and address for the record and be sworn in. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Helen Gibson, 312 Twisted Oak Drive. And, um, okay. Can you spell this here? Thank you, testimony. You're about to get into the group. The horse is in that specialty. Yes. I appreciate the opportunity to come before you this morning. Uh, I live in probably the fourth parcel from the end of the cul-de-sac. Cul I, I think that's an old area because my roof, is, our roof has changed now, the color. <laughs> um, we've been living there for 25 years. Um, this subdivision has been there um, as our neighbor previously stated, there have now been two new subdivisions added. I knew that when Mr. Butler moved out that ultimately this was going to end up being another subdivision. Um, but there are two things. Um, the point that he made about the traffic on this road, um, when the, uh, right after, I think, um, before Ivan or right after Ivan and right before Katrina, uh, there was another subdivision built further south on West Roberts, the Quail uh, Ridge, I believe it is. And there, it was the developer had proposed to extend West Roberts through that subdivision and bring it back out onto uh, the other end, uh, onto Pine Forest Road. That was basically denied. This, the county engineer at that time uh, kind of opposed extending that road, which uh, was a very bad thing because this is a very narrow road, West Roberts. It um, is a two-lane, very narrow, probably 20 miles per hour is what you need to be doing on that road. And so since that subdivision was added, which was 100 units, we've got two additional <laughs> subdivisions put in, and um, now we're proposing another one, which is an additional 60. So uh, my concern is that there are very old heritage oaks all along that, and I know that in Ivan, those limbs came down, we were stuck. Uh, thank God our neighbors grabbed the chainsaws, but um, it's really uh, something to think about in terms of uh, um, a disaster, a hurricane, something like that, where all of these people have to come out. I mean, it is getting kind of congested also on West Roberts, and this will increase the traffic there. That's my secondary concern. My principal concern is the storm water. There are uh, springs that run through that area running downhill, and I, actually, I should say I'm not opposed to it, but I'm just, I would just like these issues to be uh, taken into account. Um, I definitely am concerned about storm water in that area, particularly when you're um, filling in wetlands. That's going to increase uh, storm water issues. Um, I'm, I'm close to the bottom of the hill. 
this property is a hill. Just if I can have another right, yep. couple of seconds. This property is, is on a hill. All of this property is running down to the creek. I was told that the stormwater was going to be going to the regional pond, okay. and now I heard the developer or the engineer state that it's going to the existing pond. I would feel much more comfortable if it were definitely be going to the regional pond and not sitting in going into a pond that is currently deficient based on the current um, standard as he is identified. So those are basically my concerns with it. I'm not opposed. Thank you so much. All right, we do have one more speaker, Mr. Larry Downs Jr. If you'll please come forward, state your name and address for the record. I don't know if we need to sort you in again for this case or not. Larry Downs Jr., 12156 Habberg Drive, Pensacola, Florida, 32506. And, uh, you know, I, I feel for the two people here who uh, who are going to be somewhat impacted, but, but you know, that's the, that's the problem with freedom. You can't have freedom without freedom. It? It's kind of the, it's, it's the conundrum. It's the problem, you know. With freedom, you have the you you have the freedom to advocate against freedom. Isn't that isn't that just? It's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. Now, see that big parcel right there. If that big parcel, of course, was there before those subdivisions around it. Now these two individuals would probably have no house if y'all listened to the to the big property owner when he said, I don't want any subdivisions around me. <laughs> Do you see how this just continues? So at what point, you know, do 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 we decide to say, nah, that that freedom, we just, you know, it's good for some. But once you get yours, let's Let's lock the gate, throw away the key. <laughs> Nobody else is to get it. No, move forward with this. We need, we need housing. Of course, we might not need as much housing with the excess deaths coming. You know what I mean? We have all-cause mortality deaths more than ever before. Hold on. Let me just tell you real quick. This is about this case. This is a, a bill. New bill would force homeless off public spaces. Yeah, we have homeless. The county, the city, is spending our money trying to make affordable housing. <laughs> you know what will make housing affordable? If we get the government out of it. If we get all of these regulations and taxes and, you know, it's that's the way it once was. And, of course, they had those dirty septic systems, you know. They're like, oh, God, we can't have them septic systems, you know. We can't have those wells. You put a well just a little too close to that septic system, you could get contaminated water. Meanwhile, we're getting contaminated water from our own governments. <laughs> there we go. All right. Move forward with it, please. I mean, it's freedom. You have to vote for freedom, even if it's inconvenient and just unsightly and downright dangerous and nasty. You still have to go with it because there's nothing... This has increased prosperity more than freedom in the whole existence of humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Downs. All right, at this time, do we uh, have anything else from staff that they'd like to add or from the applicant that you'd like to, to add? No. I do want to add that staff is in support. Staff is in support of this plan unit development. Um, staff does, staff does with the with enhancements that are mentioned that they are going to propose, staff is definitely in favor of all of those enhancements and do consider those things will be an improvement and asset of, in, in this area because of those enhanced things that are always, uh, that are necessary for the approval of a plan unit development. And, and all of the stormwater improvements, I know that those things will be considered um, and all of those other issues will be considered as well. Okay. Miss Gibson. I don't know if I can have another If you'll just come up to the mic and I'll let you add a statement here. Um, I just would like to know if the um, common area, the park, 
is going to be open to the entire neighborhood. When we talk about mitigation and the impact on the neighborhood, um, I understand the improvements are great. It would be great if they could be open to the all of the subdivisions in the neighborhood. Gotcha. I'll let Mr. Hammonds answer that question. In the past, PUDs were always required to be private, or it might be that I, I did Redfish Harbor, but it's in 14 or something. And it might be that it was private because one of our variances was a reduced right away, so I'm not sure. But I think we're, this is planned to be public. That's what we call out on our plan. Yes. And the plan didn't get put up there so they could see the part. Y'all got the plan. You can put, you can pull it up there so they can see it if you don't mind. I'm pretty sure we say public. Tom, it's a public road, correct? Yes, sir. In Stormwater, yes, sir. Next one. Yes, please. Uh, well, that PDF is kind of Blue. rough, but that's the wetland. Mm -hmm. And then you see the sidewalk come off the road below that, yeah. And then it walks up past the wetland buffer, and then you can see where all the amenities are. And then we also have a 10-foot buffer from any of the amenity area. We're going to put vegetation in there, and then we're going to have a six-foot privacy fence. All these things were asked for by staff. Yes. During the DRC of this the original DRC all right so I think that hopefully answers the question all the, the roads are public sidewalks are be public and I think therefore your amenities would also be public right so if it's public okay. then anybody can come in there mm -hmm. all right one more This goes back to the uh, question of the traffic impact on this roadway, West Roberts. Um, is there anyone that has generated any trips per day information? And if you have analyzed whether or not that road is at capacity or near capacity? So currently, the county doesn't have, right. what am I looking for, what's the word, concurrency, traffic right. concurrency. Right. We don't. So I'm sure that when I go through this, I'll be asked by Jason Walters in traffic to start doing turn movements in certain areas and this kind of thing. That's something we do when we do a preliminary plan construction plan. Um, I know a lot generates 9.52 trips a day. So I'm not sure if she could probably look at that and her family and the people there and got two or three cars. But the Institute for Traffic Engineers manual says 9.52 trips a day for single family detached housing. So you can do that times 60. That's how many trips are going to come out here. And that's how many is coming out of the one below us and the one above us and all the other ones in there. Any questions from uh, the board? No, just pointing out for Mrs. Gibson's sake that this is something that would be considered during the development review process. They would have to answer these standards and make sure that they're up to the expectations in that process. Right. I mean, that kind of work and stormwater design and all that's not something that you want an applicant to pay for all that engineering stuff to get here and get shot down. Right. So those, those, we haven't done that kind of time yet, but we will be. And it's going to be required if, as it proceeds, yes, right. definitely. And those future meetings for the general public, they still get notifications. Um, not, for, not for the DRC process, but when the plans are made available, they can come in, they can get a copy of the plans. And Ms. Gibson, she's already came here. So she, she, anyone, they can always right. contact us, and we'll be glad to discuss those things with them. Absolutely. <laughs> there will be a sign at DRC put on the site, so yes, they, will yes. be, they will see a sign. You will see a sign for the DRC meeting, um, and you can also find DRC meetings on the, the county website, correct? And, all right. Okay. Thank you. Any, any further questions from the board at this time? All right. If not, then I'll entertain a motion 
as we have no more speakers and nothing from the applicant or staff. Make a motion to approve. Okay, we've got a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. All right, is there any discussion from the board? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your right hand. All right, motion carries seven to zero. Um, all right, at this time, our uh, rezoning meeting uh, is adjourned, and we will jump back over to wrap up our regular planning board meeting. We do have a discussion item, uh, a Sunshine Law presentation. So I'll turn that over to staff to go over this time. I'll attempt to keep this brief. Uh, this is because we have a new board member, uh, Mr. Nelson. Uh, so. so Sunshine Law provides citizens a right of access to government, governmental proceedings and documents created in the regular course of business. Uh, it applies to any interaction between two or more members of the same board. Uh, discuss some matter which will foreseeably come before the board for action. Uh, notably, that includes talking about uh, the uh, issues discussed at a board meeting after the meeting uh, because it could foreseeably come back to the board. Uh, so that would be inappropriate and in violation of Sunshine Law. Sorry, let me get this straightened out. Uh, the scope of the Sunshine Law, board members may not engage in private discussions with each other about the board business, uh, either by in-person, emailing, text message, any other type of communication, uh, not limited really to electronic, any type of communication uh, that you may have. Uh, individual staff are not prohibited from discussing board business with staff or non-board member. Uh, if you have questions for staff, you're, you are able to speak to them about specific issues. Uh, you cannot use staff as liaison for uh, a communication with other members of the board. Uh, so they can't just be a messenger um, for conversations. So no polling. Uh, there's three basic requirements of uh, the Sunshine Law. It's that they're open to the public, reasonable notice, and minutes of meeting must be prepared. We make sure that happens every time, but those are the requirements that must be met. Uh, it applies to advisory boards, uh, so even non-decision-making boards, if they offer recommendation, it still applies to them. Uh, staff meetings are not normally subject to Sunshine Law, so there's, if they're part of the decision-making process and not more administrative, uh, they're subject to uh, the Sunshine Law. It focuses on the nature of the act, so if it's more administrative, not subject to Sunshine Law, and if it is, uh, it would be. Exemptions are strictly construed, so uh, w whenever these things go up, they're strict strictly construed against, uh, for, in favor of open government. Uh, as we've seen, uh, boards may adopt reasonable rules and policies to ensure orderly conduct. Uh, people have the right to film peacefully. Uh, they, they can walk, they, they, we, we had that today of course. Uh, they, they can walk around peacefully and record the meeting. Uh, they, they don't actually need to even show ID. Uh, but non-disruptive acts uh, can be limited. Uh, pub boards must allow an opportunity to public to be heard before the board takes official action on, on a proposition. We, we've done that in every meeting here. Uh, it's, it can be a reasonable amount of time. We've considered two minutes. The Florida Sunshine Manual does not prescribe a 
specific time period that is enough, uh, but two minutes has been shown to be enough, so uh, it works for us. Uh, penalties, it can range from removal from the board, non-criminal infraction, punishable by fine up to $500, and it can be a, if it's a knowing violation, uh, it can be a second degree misdemeanor. So all this is really covered in section one or chapter 119, uh, Florida Statutes. Uh, it provides a lot of the Sunshine Law, which isn't really applicable to you all, but that's where it, all the source of the law is found in, is in 119. Uh, and, and really, for, for your information, if you ever have questions about it, it I, I'm always available for questions about the Sunshine Law, or there's also the Sunshine Law Manual Handbook uh, published each year that's particularly useful if there's some strange cases that come up. It, it does address a lot of these, these stranger uh, fact patterns, um, and it's useful as a resource for you all. Um, public records, uh, so this is what qualifies as a public records. Uh, it's documents, papers, letters, maps. Really the physical form isn't important. Uh, it includes text messages, emails, uh, really anything along those lines. Uh, and it made in the transaction of official business. Um, so as, as part of your role as a board member, uh, which is used to perpetuate, communicate, or formalize knowledge. So your own notes about a specific issue are not it would depend on the circumstances, but are typically not uh, subject to Sunshine law, uh, Public Records uh, because they weren't meant to perpetuate knowledge. It's not a communication, essentially. Uh, it's So it typically would not be unless it's for uh, intended for the use of somebody else. Public records cannot be withheld the request of the sender. Uh, so you can't just make a request that it's not subject to Sunshine Law. Uh, it, it will be if it's made in the course of business and otherwise subject to public re or Sunshine Law. Uh, request cannot be denied because it's overbroad. Uh, people ask for all sorts of things and extending over different time horizons and, and subject matters, which can be lengthy. Uh, so it, it can't be denied because they're overbroad. Uh, and the county processes all these sunshine law, sunshine requests, and, and does their best uh, to provide them. Uh, agency may not require the uh, requester to identify themselves or herself uh, to make the request. So anyone can make the request. And it, the, going along those lines, the purpose of the request doesn't matter. Uh, reasonable amount of time this is more for the county uh, and uh, but at, if you're ever requested from the county uh, doing it in a reasonable amount of time uh, it's not overly burdensome to comply with the request from the county to produce records and all, all the records must be re retained in accordance with retention schedules approved by the Department of State. This does vary depending on the type of record it is. Uh, with storage being as cheap as it is, best practice is to not really delete things, uh, county records. Uh, it's problematic and it, it leads to uh, a lot of negative consequences of deleting uh, public records. And I'll open the floor for questions if you have any. All right, any questions from anybody? Your presentation started with very strict limitation that it is among members of the same board. Um, any misappropriation that you can identify between a member of this board and a county commissioner in a private meeting about matters that are coming before both boards sooner or later? Isn't that allowed? 
I mean, last it, I checked, it's, it's only, only between the voting board members there. Right. But not on By the strict levels. definition of your presentation, it is limited to this bank of people right here. If I may, if I may, if I may, um, and also to there, there's an appearance. There's an appearance. That's a good question. That, that, that especially with the planning board, this type of governmental board. I mean, y'all touch ordinances, y'all touch rezonings, y'all code changes that are coming that go and impact the entire county. And many times, in like in the legislative processes. When they talk about ordinances, it's gonna have to go before the the commissioners, and and and, and those are not as quasi judicial. However, if it's something that may be favorable for somebody in the legislative setting, when it comes to ordinances, it's you may want to still be governed by your own because the appearance, the ones that get into the public. It still gets sort of a little dicey. Although many times with the legislative process, it's not with ordinances it's a little different. But the planning board sees some of everything. So, and, and it's important to remember how the process works through all of this. Uh, these things can arise to ex parte communications, mm -hmm. which would have to be disclosed by the commissioner right. at the board meeting that they had ex parte communications about the matter. Yes. Um, so it would have to be disclosed if it's written communication. It would have to be placed in the public record at the, at the BCC. Uh, so, so those conversations do amount to uh, ex parte communications. Especially with kind of rezonings. I mean, you may rezonings with quite a judicial. I, I, I would suggest that you leave that. I mean, don't even, don't even try to make your office about it because if that get out, especially that gets, mm, that can, like you said, if it's not disclosed, it's track well. So, especially when it comes to rezone re quasi judicial cases, that's that, I, that could be a technicality that could really, really. I agree, and I would hope that's our practice. Well, I just wanted clarification on it for this presentation's sake. It started with the statement, uh, and it's underlined the same board. It's limited to members of the same board, and. That immediately raised a red flag with me that I would think that that it goes beyond that. It goes to talking to commissioners or anyone in the upline of a process application. Uh, in our case, that would be ex parte. Well, yeah, that makes sense for ex parte, but it's not governor of the sunshine. Like, we're not supposed to be talking to them. I mean, we're supposed to be taking their guidance, especially for any of those, especially when it comes to these district roles. You know, at least that's how I was always in the interpretation of that. The, pr the principle I go by, I take their guidance on principle, not on individual case. I strongly suggest, and Chris is here, when it comes to rezonings and rezonings, that you, if you're going to make, if, you, if there's any concerns after you, after you not even talk, you definitely can't talk to them them. But you, you direct it to me, staff, and then I'm governed as well. Um, I, I, if I got to take it up to legal or Chris or Allison about something that maybe I would, I would be the filter and I take it to the proper channel so that those commissions, they, they, you have to be very, you, you still have to maintain something. That's why we channel through them and they, and they, can, they can help be the filter. I'm in agreement there. Uh, ex parte communications are a bit different than Sunshine Law. Uh, if that's something the board wants more explanation of, I can work towards providing that in some sort of handout or something along those lines, uh, just to provide more guidance along ex parte communication. I would like oh, to see avoid that. It. What's that? I would like to see that. As, the, as a new guy, I would like to see a little more on the, the ex parte communications. I'm very open to providing that, like I said earlier, uh, on on doing things like that for you all. I'd like to, uh, you know, I'm the only one here, I guess, that has not uh, been appointed uh, in my current role. Although being appointed before, I was grateful that I received, I communicated with my uh, commissioner at one time, and that was him calling me to tell me that he disagreed wholeheartedly with my decision. And, um, but he, he, the caveat to that was he said, and that's why I selected you. I knew that you weren't, uh, you know, you guys are appointed.
by your county commissioner, not to be his voice, but because you're worthy of having your own voice and you've got uh, the biggest uh, asset you have is a sense of logic and fairness. And when you're here and you, you hear these things, you have to use your own brain. And that's what they appointed you for. So, I mean, I think that the, the I mean, Mr. Fears, it's great because nobody talked to me about it. I, I didn't know if I'd be getting a call every month or not. And I was grateful that uh, regardless of who it was or who, uh, I was just glad that I was not supposed to be their third, uh, you know, arm. And that's not the role, I don't believe. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. And then you got the two over here on the end of the table here that are non-voting members. Okay, so, uh, and I do communicate at times if I think there's a problem, and it may be multiple county commissioners, yeah. So I just want to make th these fellows on this board here know that I'm not tied underneath the same rules. And I've even wondered about whether I say that no to all. You know, I have to ask her sometime to bring a map up because I have constituents that call me, okay? <laughs> And I, I probably don't even have to go by that rule, that little rule before you ask everybody if they had a conversation with anybody. But I, I do it. I would never tell y'all which constituent because that's between me and my constituent. So anyway, that's my comments on that. All right, any further questions? All right, thanks so much. Yes. Next board meeting. Um, Back in May of 2023, we had the NAS Joint Land Use Compatibility Study come before us. We now have a final version. Um, it is going to be on an expedited path. This is a final version of it. So this next February meeting, I'm putting it on the BCC agenda as a consent item. Planning Board is going to come before you as the only item for March 5th to be heard at the BCC on March 7th. So that's the only item that got added to your agenda next month. And, and, and that basically is a, a pass through um, that making recommendations to, to pass it on. It, it must move before the board. It, it, it has to be. If there have been thorough, many, many, many meetings, this is a citizen driven project, many meetings. So it just, it, it got to come through this board as according to the state law. And we will, uh, it got to keep on board. All right, thanks. All right, we do have uh, one seeker for a public forum, Mr. Larry Downs Jr., if you'd like to. Come up and state your name and address, and we'll get your time started. Larry Downs Jr., Plumbing, LLC, because fecal matters. Also, missionobvious.com. Y'all go check that out. It's got some real stuff on there that is not allowed on social media. Uh, real quick, and, and one, one way I can tie this in, which I don't think I have to because it says public forum. Uh, either we got to change up the you know, public forum or it's public. <laughs> no, you can't have, can't have public forum without public forum. So anyways, I uh, just wanted to read y'all real quick, uh, Florida Surgeon General, because our county commissioners were pushing the COVID injections. They were telling us citizens to get them. That's kind of public. <laughs> so they appointed most of y'all. So, And uh, Mr. Tim is right. Uh, you're not supposed to operate as their voice. That's why they pulled me off the contract competency board, because I wouldn't operate as their voice. Accuse me of not performing my duties because I recuse myself. Because I'd done work for the contractors that was before us. And they had done work for me and I sponsored their Little League baseball team. Are you kidding me? The county attorney said, yeah, that's that's a good recusal. Eh, not for Stephen Barry and Luma May. They couldn't, they couldn't wait to get me off there because I opposed their re-election. That's how it works. So y'all don't let them push you around. Uh, anyways, Florida Surgeon General... Uh, the Surgeon General outlined concerns regarding nucleic acid contaminants in the approved Pfizer and Moderna COVID-19 mRNA vaccines, particularly in the presence of lipid nanoparticle complexes and simian virus 40. Whew, that was a Napoleon shot. Uh, promoter enhancer DNA. 
Lipid nanoparticles are an efficient vehicle for delivery of the mRNA in the COVID-19 vaccines into human cells and may therefore be equally efficient vehicle for delivery contaminant DNA into human cells. The presence of SV40 promoter enhancer DNA may also pose a unique and heightened risk of DNA integration into human cells. Just a couple bullet points here. DNA integration could theoretically impact a human's oncogenes, the genes which can transfer a healthy cell into a cancer cell. Have y'all noticed there's a lot of cancer? A lot of cancer. You just go to cancer.org. The cases are through the roof. It's weird. And not only that, there's cancer advertisements for treatments and trials just through the roof. Just scroll through Facebook. You'll see them. I've screenshotted over probably a thousand of them in the past year. Uh, DNA integration. This is from our Florida Surgeon General, Dr. Joseph Latipole. DNA integration poses a unique, unique and elevated risk to the human health and to the integrity of the human genome, including risks that DNA integrated into sperm or egg gametes could be passed on to the offspring of the COVID-19 vaccine right. recipients. Thanks, y'all believe Larry. that? I gave a couple of y'all this paper. All right, Eric, I know you wanted to add something. That's uh, amazing. About, <laughs> about um, Thanks, Larry. Like, the presentation we had earlier well, um, it, it was just a thought but i'm glad i waited on it because i okay. almost talked myself out of it during the meeting but anyway <laughs> um so expert witnesses a lot of what the ones i've experienced on the board are um applicant driven the the applicant asks them to come and speak on their behalf not as their i separate expert witness from expert eight and agent has carte blanche uh, at the podium um, for the case. But an expert witness, if it's strategically planned that they're going to come, could that not be established and uh, ensconced in the agenda with the application so that we know beforehand, not walking in, filling out a pink sheet and impromptu asking the board to identify as an expert witness? I love that idea, but I think there's a problem with that because an expert witness can come as a member of the public. Yeah, though. that's so the that's part where I almost talk yeah. myself out because you could have an opposing person from the public asking to be considered an expert witness. And then it's on our toes whether to qualify him or her uh, as expert. But I, I thought it issue. would take care of the lion's share of them if it's an applicant asking. I, I, I see the issue with that um, being done last minute. The problem is you find out about it kind of last minute, too, when people come. Um, and that's for the board to decide those kinds of things. Um, keep in mind, you can determine how much credibility you give to a person. Uh, and, and the standard, it's preponderant, it's more likely than not. And these are sworn statements. So if someone says they're a real estate agent and you know, they don't have their ID card with them, or, it's not necessary. Uh, it's more likely than not. Uh, and you can weigh their credibility. It's for you to weigh the evidence. Uh, this just makes it a part of the record that can be qualified as competent, substantial evidence. And that really is the key to these things, especially when there's disagreements with staff there has to be competent, substantial evidence for, for, for the record to support your decision if it goes against staff. And sometimes that's kind of tricky. Uh, it, it has to be, there has to be re, 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 uh, evidence on the record to support the board's decision. So I think, yeah, I, I think we need to have the latitude. If someone does walk in, you know, last minute, it, you have here your qualification of expert criteria if we had, kind of have that in our hip pocket, then we can go through it and we can weigh it, you know, we can question the app, question the so-called expert and make that decision. I, I think there was a case either last, last board or two boards ago where regarding appraisals and the person said, I'm an expert and he was a, a loan officer, I believe. And I think Reed 
kind of question that. I think, wasn't that driven by Chris on that one? You wanted to take it in as an expert? No, I, no it's it, not that. That's not the, it was, it's just when yeah. it's phrased like that, it's confusing to the board, you know, what to do with that evidence. Uh, and if someone holds himself out to be an expert, then I think it's our right to, if we have our bank of questions, to determine whether or not we're willing to accept that. I think that's, <clears throat> that we should, we should keep that in our hip pocket. And I think it should be available in instances where a member of the public does show up. And that's why I brought it up last at that meeting, is because he claimed he was an expert. That just kind of alarm bells kind of go off when that happens. Just for just for the record, uh, when someone claims that they're an expert, it, it's important uh, that the board either qualify or not qualify them as an expert. That's a yeah. It's going to be a gray area every time. We're we're just going to have to be ready to pivot and qualify them. Well, my case. just my opinion, and I'm the new guy. I mean, it's kind of common sense, right? Tom today. I thought I remember right. He had two certified numbers for two different states. He's a yeah. professional engineer, so we kind of have to gather that and just apply some common sense. He definitely 100% an expert, but but today he functioned as the agent, right? Yeah. So, Correct. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's many opportunities that we've listened to an expert and we've changed our mind because of a person out there that says I'm a expert at XYZ. The only time that we actually take advice that we've taken advice is A, engineers, and B, lawyers, that I could remember. And those two deserve to have, the, they have their credentials to, if they say white is black and black is white, you can trust that they did the research on it. So, I, I you know, I appreciate all the talk and all the discussion, but I don't think we have a lot of instances that this is really going to change a ruling uh, in the court. So, it's my thought. Do we have an example where this has come up for Escambia County from the planning board aspect where we've had an expert witness that, well, I don't want to say was not compromised, but not an expert that went in front of a court case? Are we having that issue right now? No. Really, the most, the, most often it's a case where there wasn't. Uh, competent substantial evidence in the record that makes it challenged on appeal. Uh, going so back to lack of expert, lack expert. of any competent Just, substantial okay. evidence, which can include. Uh, so, are we looking for more expert witnesses? Essentially, is that the better of the say? In this whole I scenario? wouldn't phrase like, it like that, but it's helpful to the record when someone has qualifications that they be given uh, the benefit of the that. Bit, well, cer certain. Uh, ability to speak on it and, and be weighed as a ec expert in that. Not that you have to I keep going. Not that you have to accept their opinion. It's just you, you can weigh it itself. Okay. If, they, if you don't qualify them, you can't weigh the the expert opinion. Okay. So I think the example we're talking about, where the person held themselves out as an expert, well. Then what are your credentials? I right. think we have the right to ask yeah, that. Yeah, exa so exactly. If someone holds, and I was serious when I asked, even though it was wasn't the rezoning, Larry Downs. Is he? What are your credentials? A master plumber in the business for thirty years. Right. I've worked on a thousand septic tanks. I was. I'm serious about that to lend credibility to his his testimony. And I think it applies both in quasi-judicial as well as in the planning board. When we're, we have to make a decision on, on a case, I think it's applicable. And, this, and if I may, and if I may, and, and typically you all board is good with this as well. If someone say they're an expert walker, even even with uh, what's his name Reed and and our other uh, ex chairman, they would ask, well, this person want to be considered, and they begin to so so y'all, I mean, they begin to list their things and. And if they were not, we haven't had, like, like we said, we haven't had that come up too often. We know Buddy Page, Mr. Page, um, and, 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 and the en engineers who may come and sometimes represent, like we just uh, turn this in a separate category, but a neighbor will come, well, I'm an expert. I've been living there 20 years and those things like that. Yeah, I don't think we've ever had that issue. Yeah, we haven't had and Buddy Page is a, you know, is, is a, Planner. I mean, he's he, planner, he has yeah. certification for that. Right. So, and we have, had, we have had real estate agents come come in, and I and I will, will let Mr. Reed. He can help if that if that do come up. 
I think Mr. Reed know how to engage that. So we've also had environmental issues. Environmental, with yes. Birds and animals and uh, and the wildlife. We've had people talk on behalf and provide their educational background <clears throat> prior to their testimony. Yeah, so. And some people have even said that they speak for the trees. Oh, yeah. oh God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, On that note. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. So we've got, Horace, you got anything? <laughs> Not after that? Nothing. Not after that. <laughs> All right, good stuff. Sure, All right, I, I wanted yes, to sir. ask uh, Horace if, if uh, was it, has there discussion from any of the county commissioners to uh, rewrite the land development code? Um, only, only certain aspects because we just did this in 2015. Yes, yes, yes. It's still not. It's still not perfect. Was a whole lot better than what it was, and and and, and many times because no, and I don't think I'm putting this coming because it's a month. It's a it's a half a million dollar project. It's, it's quite exorbitant, but we just we just wrote it in 2015, and and, and it's a whole lot better. So there's still some tweaks that are being modified, and we are working to work those things. And I, I'd simply ask because I just heard a county commissioner recently said, "Oh, we're going to," and it was at a you know I'm not holding them accountable. Kind of, oh, we're going to rewrite the whole thing, and my eyes started twitching. So I just wanted to ask if there was a. a you know, movement to rewrite the land. I, I understand certain things we addressed and I always. More or less, more or less saying it, but I think it was a specific juncture that a more interest in. Yes, sir. All right, good stuff. If uh, we got nothing else, we'll see y'all on March 5th. Thanks. Thank